Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started. I hope you've had a nice time meeting with your colleagues, enjoying this nice sunny weather in St. Louis. Well, welcome and bienvenidos to the 2023 Midwest Climate Summit. We are thrilled to be gathering here in person at Washington University here in St. Louis and online to celebrate and collaborate this week with all of you. We are here because of our care and concern for our planet and this special place in the middle of the country, the Midwest. So to kick us off, yes, woo! How often do people get excited about the Midwest? Well, we do, that's what makes this special. So to kick us off, I would like to invite Dr. Pamela Begay to the stage to deliver a land acknowledgement. Dr. Begay is the director of the Catherine M. Booter Center for American Studies here at WashU's Brown School of Social Work. She is also a member of the planning committee for the Midwest Climate Summit. Welcome, Pam. Thank you, Yat E. Pam Begay Inishia, Ashitli Inchle, Hawanthana Bashishchin. We acknowledge that the land we meet on today at Washington University in St. Louis is the ancestral homelands of the Osage, Missouri, and Illinois Confederacy. These tribes and others made their homes and were stewards of this land between the rivers that many of us know today as the Mississippi, the Illinois, the Missouri, Merrimack, and Bur Burbies, to name a few. These tribes were removed forcibly and unjustly in a systematic campaign, often led right here in St. Louis. Thank you, Pam. We recognize that many of us in this room are beneficiaries of that unjust removal and occupation. We are gathered this week to foster and strengthen relationships, to deepen collaborative efforts to address the climate crisis. We are grateful for the sharing of traditional ecological knowledge from natives peoples, native peoples all around the Midwest and recognize all of our relatives in this work, those that have come before us, those that will follow, including all those that live on land, in the air, and in the water. It's up to each of us to do our own research to honor the native peoples who lived and continue to live in the places where we are from and to recognize that these land acknowledgements are just one step in recognizing and supporting indigenous communities and the experience and wisdom they bring to our shared climate work. Next, I would like to invite Angela Pearson to the stage. Angela is the Special Projects Manager in the office of Mayor Tashara O. Jones, the mayor of the city of St. Louis and a member of the MCC Steering Committee. Welcome, Angela. Thank you, Heather. Good evening, everyone. As Heather said, I am Angela Pearson uh, with Mayor Tashara Jones's office. Unfortunately, she's not able to be with us this evening, um, so she sends her regrets. Um, so I'm here to welcome you all on behalf of Mayor Jones. So the city of St. Louis is leading in building energy performance standards in 2020. We passed a landmark legislation that strategically targets um, emission levels from large and commercial um, buildings, making us the fourth in the nation and first in the Midwest to do so. We know that 80% of our emissions in the city of St. Louis are generated by buildings, and this ordinance covers municipal, commercial, institutional, and residential properties 50,000 50, square feet and larger. This pioneering work garnered attention from the White House, and the city of St. Louis was invited to be a part of the National Building Performance Standards Coalition, joining municipalities across the country working together to improve, to improve their BPS policies and regulations. The city of St. Louis is proud to be a member of the MCC Steering Committee, and we're proud that you guys are here today for the first MCC um, conference. So thank you all for making the investment and being here today. During this conference, you will have the opportunity to attend sessions where you can learn from industry leaders, where you can share best practices with other government officials and nonprofit leaders. You will also have the opportunity to experience St. Louis through the Marble Workshops, and we hope that you enjoy your time here. I also want to encourage you, if you have the time, to explore St. Louis, because we're a gym, 
in the Midwest. Um, if you love live music, I encourage that you visit our, our Blues Museum or Jazz St. Louis. If you like to be outdoors, you're near Forest Park where you can take a stroll through our park, go to the zoo, the art museum, or visit the, the Missouri History Museum. And then also, we're near the Loop where you can patronize local shops and restaurants, which is in walking distance. So again, thank you for being here in St. Louis. We welcome you and we hope you have a great conference. Thank you, Angela. Washington University is one of over 60 members of the Midwest Climate Collaborative, and they host the MCC here on campus, and they have been instrumental in ensuring that this first year has been a great success. So I would next like to welcome the Vice Provost of Interdisciplinary Initiatives here at Washington University to the stage, Mary McKay. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. We're going to have to interact a little bit here. <laughs> Welcome to Washington University in St. Louis. We are thrilled that you are here. And so I am going to take a few minutes um, not to give you a full lecture, even though we're primed for that in this room, but to welcome you uh, to this very special conference and this collaborative and to really situate the work that you are going to do together in the larger mission of the university and particularly our university's strategic plan. And so um, I'm just going to go through just a couple of slides so that um, I can tell you a little bit about our ambitions, um, our, our strategic plan, our 10-year vision for Washington University. We call it here and next. I'm often wearing my green dress. My colleagues remark that I'm in blue today. Um, but pay attention to this branding because this is a, a really serious effort for us to mobilize our entire institution to really think about our research mission, our educational mission, our, our what we do in patient care, and really make a greater and greater impact uh, in our world. And that's what you are committed to as well. Well, that won't be it. Well, when the buttons do work, um, it, it puts down um, our, our kind of vision statement for our here and next strategic plan. Really the mobilization of what universities do well to establish Washington University and St. Louis. So thank you for being such a champion of our city to really think about our university, our city and region as a global hub for transformative solutions to some of the societal's deepest challenges. And so usually academics then would go through a set of 20 slides to tell you about the core features of our strategic plan. Thank goodness our team is made up of both academic leaders but also communications experts. So this is the whole plan on one slide. And so the things that I want to just orientate you around here and next is that there's three pillars of, of activities that we are going to lean into, elevate, and we hope really innovate for, for impactful change. That's a research pillar, a people pillar, and a community pillar. So if you think about research, you'll see environmental research at the bottom on the left-hand part of the slide. My colleague Dan Jamar from McKelvey School of Engineering is here. Dan has been working across our schools, across stakeholder groups to put together a center that truly can support high impact research. Um, climate change is an incredibly important part of that environmental research center. Um, public health is certainly connected to the environment and the changes that you're going to be talking about over the next set of years because we know that a changing planet also impacts the health and well-being of populations and particularly enlarges disparities of those made vulnerable by poverty, by racism. So incredibly important set of research initiatives that Washington University is going to lean into and really bring our entire disciplines to bear on some of those areas, uh, some of those strategic priorities in our research pillar. We also want to really think about Washington University as a place for the people to thrive. And so students, faculty, and staff, those certainly are important stakeholder groups. And we want to think about how do we support those groups, create new opportunities for them, and really innovate in the spaces that they learn and teach in and really come to work every day. 
And St. Louis is incredibly important to us and our commitment to be an even more impactful neighbor, to really think about collaborative partnerships where we co-design what needs to be worked on together, incredibly important for this strategic plan within our community pillar. The solutions that St. Louis can come up with certainly has a great deal of influence, not only on what happens in our region, but across the nation, across the globe. And so we're excited about the work that you do here because I think it has certainly regional implications. I'm from the Midwest, so please concentrate on this part of the country, but also think about the larger impact that you're trying to make as well. And so with that, I just wanna thank you for coming together across disciplines, across geographic boundaries, across perspectives to really put together new solutions that matter. These are complex challenges um, and we need transformative solutions and you are part of that. So thank you, we are so pleased to be one of the partners in this effort. So thank you so much and thank you Heather for everything that you do, thank you. Thank you, Mary. So there is so much information out there about climate change, but it can be really tough to find the partners and the resources for those of us who don't live on the coast. The vision of the Midwest Climate Collaborative is a carbon neutral, climate resilient, interconnected Midwest region. And we say interconnected because we know that there is a plethora of knowledge and expertise in our region. I've been lucky to meet many of the growing number of people and organizations this past year who are striving to reduce emissions and build resiliency. From Topeka to Traverse City, Standing Rock to Springfield, pick your favorite Springfield. There is so much that we can learn from one another and even more that we can do together. We are convening this week during Black History Month, and it is a reminder that every day of every month, climate change is affecting black and brown communities more dis disproportionately, and that an equitable and effective response must center these communities who are on the front lines, either because of location, history of redlining, access to resources, or other disparate conditions. As we planned this summit, we sought to create a space where a wide breadth of issues could be discussed and perspectives shared. There are many conferences out there, but what makes this one different is that we are focused on cross-sector collaboration in the Midwest, stitching together organizations and networks for collective action in this region. So the planning committee has done a great job of ensuring that issues related to climate mitigation, adaptation, resilience, and justice are covered this week. They're all wearing uh, planning committee badges, so if you see one of them, please thank them this week. And I could easily spend an entire hour tonight telling you about the amazing things that the MCC has done this year, from the climate research agenda to securing our first NSF grant, the doubling of our membership um, just over this last year really speaks to the deep need for this type of convening. Um, but I'm not going to go on because we have wonderful speakers tonight, but I do just want to encourage you to take advantage of all the summit has to offer. So register for a mobile workshop before you leave tonight. These are really fabulous opportunities. Every single one of them is going to be a treat. No matter what your subject area is, you will be amazed by what you see and hear and learn in every single one of these sessions. So if you have any questions on your way out, check at the registration table and we'll make sure that you get registered. Check out the climate asset map. This is going to be one of those great resources for those of us in the Midwest and that fishbowl space. Uh, we have a prototype set up. Would love to get your feedback. Also out in the forum are tables with great information from some of the government agencies that um, are here to support us and from our sponsors as well. And I would specifically like to thank Millipore Sigma, our presenting sponsor, for their support as a corporate global climate leader. So this week is about connecting and identifying those next steps we will take together when we leave here Thursday afternoon. And we are poised as the MCC to support those steps by helping to expand capacity, connect organizations to resources and partners, and build collective action. We are still young, having formed just a year ago after the initial Midwest Climate Summit. And while our membership has grown to include an incredible list of organizations, institutions, and companies, we are not the complete story of climate work in the region. We know that there are many communities not represented here, but we know it will take all of us to design and implement equitable and effective solutions. So let's get to it. So tonight, we are lucky to have two fabulous leaders showing us the way. We are honored to have with us tonight Dr. Sylvia Hood Washington. She has over 40 years of research and field experience working on the impact of fossil fuel generated pollution on human health and ecosystems. 
Her professional career includes serving as a lecturer, developing and teaching courses in epidemiology, big data, and health disparities at North Carolina State University, at North Carolina State University's inaugural Data Science Academy. She has led efforts to examine environmental justice tied to water systems in the Great Lakes region, and she resides in the western suburbs of Chicago. She takes great pride in being a Midwesterner. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sylvia Hood Washington. I'd like to thank Heather for inviting me um, to be one of your keynote speakers today. Uh, I'm also appreciative of the fact that I had the opportunity this year to work with Dr. Rachel Levy at the North Carolina State University State Science Academy to create a course called Epidemiology, Big Data for Disease and Disparities, which sort of brought together all of my experience to look at the intersections of engineering, public health, history, and the environment. Uh, and finally, to acknowledge uh, Dr. Siddhartha Thakur from the Global One Health Academy at NCS State that allowed me to actually delve into planetary health, which is really what we're talking about today. Climate change is very personal to me. It's not just academic. It's not just a professional endeavor. I had the opportunity to be a descendant of uh, people who have been in the United States for over 700 years, um, spanning all continents in the, in the world. Um, the United States, I mean, North America, Asia, Europe. And so that history, that personal history combined with my professional history, allows me to have a lens to look at climate change and environmental health disparities in a very unique way, but then again, not very unique. Climate change for me really can be symbolic or symbolized by my mother's death in 1988 from a um, heart attack from a heat wave in 1988. I had to sort of look that up before I get into the slide because a lot of the research, when you look at it, a lot of the data goes back to 1995, excuse me. But 1988, what happened in 1988? Uh, during the summer, uh, we had two record-setting heat waves that end up killing between 4,800 to 17,000 people in the United States. Um, and in that summer, we had wildfires and we had drought. But there was a human cost to that. And one of those human costs was my mother. And this is going to tie this back into this, uh, this presentation today, because that heart disease is playing a role. Uh, and it's not really being discussed. We, we sort of see heart disease with COVID-19. But heart disease actually has a genetic component. And it is a genetic component that's not being actually identified in brown and black communities. So as we have heat waves and we have the heat island effect, we're also having higher rates of death from heart disease. I might start walking around this podium. <laughs> OK, so this next slide to me is a causality map, which I like my students to, to look at when they're studying public health and global health. It's a planetary health causality map. And I sort of added my own figures here. History, engineering, geography, epidemiology, and biostatistics. And so we have these driving forces. We know that engineering all right, contributes or interacts with social conditions. But history also determines social conditions and economic conditions. She just mentioned redlining. My PhD, which is a history of science, technology, and environment in medicine, was a comparative history of Eastern Euro European immigrants who came into Chicago and ended up having higher rates of death from waterborne diseases in the back of the yards compared to African American uh, migrants who left the South and came up to Chicago and experienced tuberculosis in the same time period. Both environmental components, 
both tied to social economic factors, climate change has the same type of uh, paradigm where people who are less than are less protected from these changes to the environment. And of course, geography. As she mentioned, redlining. That's one way of looking at it. But there's also areas in which individuals find themselves living. Heat island effect, right? When we think about the heat island effect, who is most impacted? Those who are in urban environments and who are concentrated now in those urban environments. Who is not allowed to move out into more sustainable and resilient spaces, right? Because of redlining, because how we perceive individuals. We have trapped individuals into environments which are less resilient and will be less resilient from climate change. I'm also a LEED certified or was a LEED certified engineer and had the opportunity to gut rehab a building in the second largest city in Illinois. Uh, but how many individuals are willing to gut rehab unsustainable spaces, living spaces for the poor, right? Who, who's doing that? So geography is important, sorry. Your geography, epidemiology and biostatistics. Data is critical to grasping what is happening to human beings. Yes, we see flooding. I had the opportunity to be the principal investigator for NSF grant after Katrina, engineering infrastructures and environmental justice. At that point, who was trapped in Louisiana? Who will be trapped now? Flooding is not new in poor communities. The lack of infrastructure is not new in poor communities. The lack of water infrastructure, sanitary infrastructures, are not, are, have been missing for over 100 years in these marginalized communities. It still is not there. So when we talk about planetary health and causality, we cannot do it without understanding the history of a space. The individuals in the space, what is their health before we have the disparities in the environment? How will it be transformed? I know we have 15 minutes. <laughs> this could be a two hour lecture easily. So what I'm talking about is who is vulnerable? What are we doing to intervene with this? So I'm gonna just throw some population and personal health in here. So who is being diagnosed with heart disease? Who is being diagnosed with the medical conditions which will make them more susceptible when we have changes in climate? Do they have the insurance? Do they have the providers who are willing to do that? To look at them before there is a crisis. That is health disparities, social determinants of health. You cannot decouple that if we talk about climate justice and environmental justice. I'm sorry, <laughs> human health. So when we, you know, I, this to me is a repetitive thing. This is about Midwest report. Uh, and we've seen this stated over and over again in, in many reports. You know, poor air quality days. We talk about asthma, extremely high temperature events, which is the heat island effect and cardiovascular disease, asthma, uh, heavy rainfalls, you know, extended pollen seasons. And so what they're predicting now is that by mid-century, you're going to have an increase in mortality. Worse in health conditions, public health speak, increase in morbidity. And of course, this is going to lead to detrimental economic impacts. And so we have to have improved health services for everyone. But I'm arguing we're going to have to have improved health services for those who are least protected, right? Who are least protected. Everyone, every life should matter, right? You shouldn't be privileged and therefore more resilient, all right? We're all paying taxes. We're all working. Everyone should have a resilient community. Now, when I saw this one, this is an image of the flooding uh, to this area. But then I thought about the flooding. Let me just throw some personal history. I'm sort of interweaving personal history with 
um, national and regional history. I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in Ohio. So one of the things that I, I remember growing up, this is history, environmental history, is that I'm not sure how many of you guys knew this, but Carl B. Stokes was the first African-American mayor, of a, major, of a major city in the United States. He was also my mother's classmate. And I remember growing up outside of Cleveland where water flooding was rampant. They had annexed themselves to the city of Cleveland in 1927 under the first black mayor in Ohio, Andrew Johnson. And they annexed themselves because of flooding that was taking place. And they never received the infrastructure to mitigate flooding in their area for 50 years. So yes, we have flooding now, but what about the flooding in these poor communities that never got that infrastructure? Just a thought. We know that with climate change, we're gonna have an increase in vectors and vector-borne diseases. And I'm not gonna read through this whole thing. You can read that for yourself. But usually when people talk about the vector-borne diseases, they're talking about Lyme disease and usually that increase in ticks in the area. And that is something that we have to be concerned about and we have to track. And so those individuals who are using those spaces have to be aware of that, but we also have to mitigate that, 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 that issue. And how do we do that? We have to tap into all of our resources, all of our, all of our public health resources, all of the individuals who are doing land management. We have to focus on that. Now here is a, a, a slide, and this is data. So I'm using data to bring home the point about what does climate change mean for us as human beings. So here we have our reported cases of Lyme disease in the United States from 1991 through 2018. And we can see the steady increase here. We, this is a <laughs> public health. This is an incidence cases per 100,000 people. So we see here we start off at four per 100,000 people, and then from 1990 here to now 2020, 20, 30 years, we've actually almost doubled this to eight cases. So we are increasing, increasing the levels of Lyme disease with increasing temperatures. Here's another nice graphic of our Lyme disease. This is our concentration. So we cannot be afraid of data. We have to track. We have to collect the data on what is happening in our geographies, not just with the, the number of ticks, but the number of health incidents tied to those vectors and that vector-borne disease. So we can see here total increases in 100,000 people here. 120, very high. This is the Midwest here, very high incidence. So with increasing temperature, increasing vector-borne diseases, and our health consequences. So this sort of summarizes what I believe uh, for community vulnerability and adaptation and my point. We have to have an effort to quantify what is happening in our geographies to make us more resilient for climate change. That is the whole point. And I acknowledge the tribal nations representative who showed up today because they rely on natural resources which are being diminished because of climate change. And how do we mitigate that? How do we, what are we doing? That's a question I would like to, <laughs> what are we doing? Even if we have the data, what are the next steps? What are the policy steps to make changes?
so again, here's a prediction. Uh, this, these are based on the models here. Northern Minnesota, 1976 to 2005. You're looking at 88 degrees Fahrenheit. But by 2065, we're talking to almost a 10 degree temperature change, both in Minnesota and southern Missouri. So temperature, the temperature changes are taking place. That data is undeniable. So again, we're, we're most concerned about climate change in the summer, which is associated with higher levels of ozone, and ozone has a direct impact on our human health. I only have five minutes left. I want to get to a, I hate to go to do this, but I, I want to get to some very important slides for me. Um, and so here again, we can see our death rate is increasing with increasing temperatures throughout the United States and the Midwest. I'm going to get to something else which is near and dear to my heart. Usually when we talk about climate change, we talk about asthma, we talk about ozone, we talk about lung disease. But I'm coming back to heart disease because our population is aging. And as I'll show you the next couple slides, it doesn't matter whether it's age or not. We're having an increase in cardiovascular diseases in this country, regardless of age. You have increases in climate change, in, in temperatures, and we're having increases in cardiovascular death. We have inequitable geographical spaces, we have a heat island effect, and so we really are in a dilemma that we have to address from a public health perspective, a medical perspective with climate change. It's not just about vector-borne diseases. What did COVID-19 reveal to us? The individuals that we know now, they were most susceptible to that pandemic, and we're actually in a tridemic now. We're in, a, we're in a pandemic of things like COVID-19. We have our annual epidemic of flu, and now we have climate change. And in COVID-19, if you had untreated heart disease, magnitudes, four to five times more likely to die from that than if you had not. If you have heart disease, four or five times more likely to die from heat island effect. We have the opportunity to harness data. We have the opportunity, we have the tools to gather that data and to make this planet more resilient to climate change in any other pandemic and epidemic that we are faced with. And I'm going to end on that. Oh, one more slide, sorry. I wanted to show you, these are just the different ages. You see in the red, it's actually increasing. It doesn't matter. This is 35 to 64 percent change is dramatic. That's 35 to 64. And this is for African Americans and you see, again, dramatic increases here in red, percent change dramatic in your area for Missouri. So with direct impacts of climate and weather, increased rate of heat-related mortality from cardiovascular Increased rate of heat related deaths, cardiovascular and respiratory, kidney diseases, heat waves. This keeps coming up, whether it's climate change, the flu. The flu actually changes your heart structure and makes you more susceptible to cardiovascular events. So the flu, 
that's been around since the 1918 pandemic. I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Following our next speaker, we will have time um, with what we've got left to do some Q&A. So you can use the app to place your questions. Um, in the Q&A, we'll also have a roaming mic as well. So please keep those in mind. I would now like to introduce someone who has been integral in helping launch the Midwest Climate Collaborative, Professor Gabe Filippelli. He's the Chancellor's Professor at the Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, IUPUI, School of Science, Director of the Center for Urban Health, and he's executive director of the Environmental Resilience Institute, and somewhere in there, he has time to serve on the steering committee of the MCC and co-PI of the MCC's first NSF grant. So, um, Gabe, please come to the stage. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, what a thrill it is to introduce my good friend twice in one week at one of these events. Um, Janet McCabe is a deputy administrator of the US EPA. Uh, she's had a very long career in public service, though. She worked uh, in Indiana and in, uh, in Massachusetts in environmental management. Uh, she's worked as, uh, in an advocacy group to, called, uh, uh, well, it's about children's health in Indianapolis as well, um, and it's, the advocacy group is still going strong, I'm happy to report. Prior to joining the EPA in April 2021, and I'm going to come back to that date for a reason, April 2021, uh, Janet was, the, was a professor of practice in the IU McKinney School of Law and the director of the, the IU Environmental Resilience Institute. I know that date, April 2021, quite well. Uh, because that was the point where me and my, my partner in crime, a co-director, Sarah Mincy, who's in the audience as well, had to, had, to, had to take up leadership of the Institute. Note, two people had to replace one Janet, right? Um, this is Janet's influence. Uh, where I see Janet having the strongest impact at the ERI is forth. with any university, it's really difficult to engage university communities to work with actual real communities out in the farmlands or the industrial lands in the Midwest, or in our case, in Indiana. And Janet actually managed to do just that. Our hallmark program, the McKinney Midwest Climate Program, is all thanks to her skill and understanding that you need to build climate resilience, not just by research that happens at universities, but by action that happens in communities. So without further ado, Janet. Hi, everybody. Gabe, that was so nice. And um, the reason that Gabe has introduced me twice in, in the space of a week is because last Friday, um, we were, um, uh, Indiana University and others hosted the annual Indiana Sustainability Conference, um, which was in a room bigger than this, had even more people in it, um, all coming together, some of them who had worked on have worked on climate change and environmental health and quality in Indiana for decades, and some of whom were um, uh, sophomores and juniors at, um, at IU learning how to do it. And um, boy, did that give me hope, um, as this event today also gives me hope. Um, so I, it's, a, it's a real honor for me to, to be here with you all tonight um, and to, to get you kicked off um, on this event. I, I feel like I was here kind of at the beginning uh, because in the fall of 2020, before there even was a Midwest Climate Collaborative, there was a conference um, that was um, brought together, um, headed by WashU, um, uh, bringing together universities from around the Midwest and other organizations to start talking about how do we bring all these resources together in the Midwest to focus on climate change? Um, a very welcome event. Um, it uh, started um, uh, with the usual sorts of planning and then poof, we had COVID and it was turned into a fully virtual event, which was absolutely remarkable. 
Um, and uh, I, I got to be part of that, as did many people in this room, I suspect. Um, and then I went off to another job and sort of forgot about you guys. Um, and in the meantime, you created this thing, you know, and you got a big, huge grant, and you actually started doing the things that that, that initial conversation was all about. Um, because we brought together a lot of people, just an amazing a number of voices representing all kinds of different perspectives, um, thinking about climate change in the Midwest. And when it was all over, people said, well, OK, what do we do now? What do we do now? Because um, one, getting together once a year, once every couple of years, is not going to cut it um, when it comes to actually making a difference um, in, in the Midwest and, and anywhere. And, and, and why the Midwest? Well, first of all, we live here. Right. So um, where else uh, would, we, would we be? Um, the Midwest, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, although I don't really need to because of Dr. Um, Washington's um, uh, excellent presentation, the Midwest is a place where climate change is having an impact and it is, and it is not good. Um, the Midwest is also a place in this country where an awful lot of greenhouse gases are emitted. Um, we are an industrial center of the country. We are an agricultural center of the country, and that's really important and gives us a really important role. Uh, but it also means that there's a lot of responsibility here in this part of the country to help with the solutions, not just with uh, making sure that our communities are safe. Um, so, uh, so I am so glad um, to be here as part of this and to see the success that you all have been having um, and the promise that was that original conference really, uh, really coming to, to fruition. I will also confess that I am not a native Midwesterner. I grew up, I grew up on the East Coast. Um, uh, I, my husband is from a small town in northern Indiana. Um, and at some point in the early 90s, we decided that we would move our family from where we were living in Boston um, back to Indianapolis. Um, and I was doing air quality work um, for the, the state of Massachusetts at the time. I came to Indiana and was fortunate enough to be able to do the same sorts of work for uh, the state of Indiana for the Department of Environmental Management. And I felt like, you know, some might think, oh, wow, you know, you're leaving you're leaving New England and you're leaving um, the East Coast where all this work is happening and you're coming to Indianapolis, really? Um, and it was the most um, empowering thing I think we could have done uh, to come to a place where this work was so important and had to, to have the opportunity to do it in a part of the country where less attention was being paid to these issues um, than in some other parts of the country. So, um, and I'm quite confident I wouldn't have uh, been able to, to move into my job at the, at the EPA um, if I hadn't um, uh, moved myself and my family to the Midwest where I picked up a really important perspective that is critical in the national conversations of how, how do we deal with air pollution and water pollution and land pollution and how do we deal with climate, climate emissions and resilience. Um, and I'm grateful first to the Obama administration and now to the Biden administration for wanting to make sure that those voices are all there present in, at the EPA. Um, and you better believe I bring the Midwest perspective to everything that I do there. So um, we, we don't need to have it repeated to us that climate change is here. Um, it is impacting the Midwest as much as any place. Uh, may look a little bit different here. Um, we don't have the, um, unless you uh, happen to live along Lake Michigan um, or the Great Lakes, um, we're not seeing the horrific scenes of, of uh, sea level rise and beach erosion. And, um, there are houses falling into the water in the Midwest, but not quite as dramatically, perhaps, as, uh, as along the coast. Um, we don't have the raging wildfires um, that, um, that our neighbors in, in California and the, and the far west do. Um, but the reality is that there is no small town, big city, suburban area, you name it, in the Midwest that is not affected by um, the climate crisis. Um, and um, I want to agree with the, with the speaker before me uh, to say that this is a public health situation. Um, it is also an economic situation, but it is a public health situation first and foremost. And it does um, not treat people fairly. 
depending on where they live, where they are, and the vulnerabilities that they may have as a result of decades and centuries of systematic uh, racism and classism that has led to inequitable situations around the country. Uh, we hear these statistics all the time. Oh, you know, this winter was the warmest on record. Um, uh, this, this summer is the warmest, right, more wildfires. We get sort of tired of hearing those things. Th those, those statements continue to be true uh, because we keep setting records. Um, in Washington, there was uh, DC. Um, there was really no snow at all this year. Um, and the, um, the cherry blossoms, which is a, um, a, a bellwether in, in Washington because of how much planning the city has to do and how many people come to visit, um, they're blooming and peaking earlier and earlier um, every year. Um, so so we've, got, we've got this issue going on for sure. Um, in the Midwest, um, the Great Lakes, the precious Great Lakes, are seeing significant changes as a result of warming temperatures. Um, there is coastal erosion there, damage to infrastructure, um, important species in the Great Lakes, including Lake Whitefish, are being impacted by those warmer temperatures, reduced ice cover. Um, these have impacts on the people who live in this part of the world, the people whose, whose livelihood depends on the resources around the Great Lakes. Um, we've had places in the Midwest with persistent drought conditions, um, and that seems to be getting worse. Um, I'm thinking of uh, areas in Western Iowa um, for years where there have been issues. Um, I have a friend who is a hydrologist who says, people only think about water when there's too much or too little of it. Um, and it seems like that's, that's mostly what we have anymore. Um, and I think we need to rethink this image of the Midwest as, as kind of a safe and comfy place to be, um, away from the hurricanes and, and, and the wildfires and such. Um, but, uh, but not so much, not so much anymore. As Gabe mentioned, when I was working at Indiana University, um, we did decide, and he gave me way more credit than I deserve, it was um, absolutely uh, a team effort and the commitment of Indiana University researchers and, and scholars um, to decide that, that, that now was the moment to invest resources into working on these issues together. And we decided to vote, focus on local communities. Um, to, to reach our hand out to mayors and county commissioners and, and other local officials who, um, it, of all people, um, have to be accountable to the people who live in their communities. And that's why they run for office and take these very challenging jobs, is because uh, they want to take care of their communities. And when the mayor looks over his shoulder and he sees the, the, um, uh, the White River cresting three times in 18 months, and he has people saying, my, my basement has now flooded three times in 18 months, and people are telling me this is a 500-year storm. I don't get it. 18 months, 500 years does not compute for me. Um, and that mayor is trying to figure out what on earth he or she is going to do to try to make life better for the people in that community and to stave off the uh, risks to public safety, to health, um, and to the economic vitality of those communities. So um, I wanted to, to take a minute. That, that's all very grim, and, um, and uh, it is very grim. So I want to sort of um, uh, turn the dial here um, and start talking about some positive things. Um, and that is the opportunity that we have right now to move forward and really make progress on these issues. Um, and for those of us that have been working in, this, in, in these fields for um, our whole careers, um, this is an amazing moment in time. And I'm just going to focus on the EPA opportunities, but, uh, but that's, not, that's not all there is. So in the last year, there have been two pieces of legislation um, that Congress has passed and the President has signed. Um, that are absolute game changers. The first was the bipartisan infrastructure law. The second was the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, these are historic, um, once in a generation, or, or maybe even more, opportunities to make significant progress in combating climate change, um, uh, ushering in a new clean energy future, and rebuilding our nation's infrastructure. If you think about it, the last time the country invested this much resources into our infrastructure was when President Eisenhower 
completed the interstate highway system. President Eisenhower, how many people in the room were alive when President Eisenhower was president? Not very many hands are being raised. That was a long time ago. Um, so, so, so this is amazing. And what, is, and what does EPA have to do with all of this? Um, EPA is responsible for distributing to states and local communities $40 billion more money to address historic issues with our wastewater and drinking water infrastructure in this country. So that includes big cities, old cities like St. Louis, like my hometown of Indianapolis, where there are chronic sewer overflows, um, where there's infiltration and inflow, um, uh, and it takes millions and millions of dollars to fix these systems. It also addresses places like Lowndes County in Alabama, where there are communities, almost entirely communities of color, that actually do not have sanitation. They have straight pipes that go from their houses out into their yards where raw sewage is deposited every single day and kids have to play and people have to live. We still have that in this country. Um, it's, it, it's unacceptable and this money is going to help with that. We, as we do that, we get to make sure through policies that EPA can put out and provide to the states and directive that we're getting from President Biden, who is no kidding about this. I'm telling you, he is really serious about this. That while we're doing this, let's make sure that we're using clean energy as much as we can. Let's make sure we're building wind and solar energy into that infrastructure improvement. Let's make sure that we're building green infrastructure instead of gray wherever we can and taking advantage of lower carbon building materials and lower emitting construction vehicles. This is an opportunity for us to, um, to borrow a phrase, um, to build back and do it better, right? To, to fix these chronic problems, but to do it in a way that is going to be more, res more resilient to those future storms and the rivers uh, rising higher than we ever expected them to and the droughts coming and, and all of that. We also, through the Inflation Reduction Act, which is massively important piece of legislation for climate safety in this country, um, EPA has another 50 plus billion dollars to help fund a number of programs that will incentivize the move to clean energy and will support all of that work. That's on top of the several hundred billion dollars that is being provided through the Treasury Department through tax incentives. So, so EPA, many people think of, and we are a regulatory agency. You can try to achieve policy that way. You can try to achieve policy by providing incentives and support to, to help people make choices that fit with a policy directive. And most of the Inflation Reduction Act is in that regard. But let me, let me tell you about a few of those. Um, a few of those. Um, we are going to become a significantly bigger grant-making organization to, um, to complement EPA's robust regulatory and scientific mission. Um, the investments that come through the, the, through the Inflation Reduction Act are going to help us reduce the nation's greenhouse gas emissions by about 40 percent. And when you combine that with regulatory initiatives and additional state and local climate actions that are happening, further private sector advances, because a lot of this is intended to, to prompt further private um, investment, um, we are well on our way to achieving the goal that President Biden set for reducing U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by 50 to 52 percent by 2030. 2030 is not that far from now, right? Um, it's really scary to think about having such a big goal. But with these kinds of resources, we can do that. The other thing about the, the, the funds from both the Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act is the, the focus it will be able, it will put um, all of us, and EPA in particular, at accelerating our work to address historic environmental injustices and empower community-driven solutions in overburdened neighborhoods all around the country. Billions of dollars, literally billions of dollars of investment in environmental and climate justice grants that, um, that are, um, cannot go 
to communities that are not considered to be overburdened by pollution and particularly vulnerable. Um, this is a, um, a, a, an absolute mandate from President Biden. Um, as I said, we're integrating climate smart investments into all of this, um, and that's a huge opportunity um, uh, for, for us to all make a difference together. We can't do these things by ourselves. Um, we have to do it in partnership with people on the ground in parts of the country who can make these projects happen. Um, let me talk about um, uh, a couple in particular, um, and I know that um, it's getting late here for, for everybody. Um, the Climate Pollution Reduction Grants, that's a program established by the Inflation Reduction Act. This is an amazing opportunity for us to support state and local climate planning activity, both for states that have not done climate planning to date and states that already have, um, but need to do an update or a refresh. So, and I mean, you just have to get a load of these numbers, right? So $250 million of planning grants will go across the country to states and local governments um, to do this climate planning, followed by almost $5 billion, $5 billion to then fund individual projects that those state and local governments will come forward with. Um, this is not enough money, of course, to solve the climate crisis, um, but it is a, a huge down payment. So we want to provide this kind of support to state, territory, local, and tribal governments, um, and they will need to come forward with partnerships and, um, and relationships with uh, communities all across their states in order to show where that money is actually going to go. This is coming fast, folks, so um, as soon as March 1st, which is next week, we will be putting out an announcement about this, um, and we'll be holding webinars um, that people are, are free to, to join to talk about the program um, and, and make sure that people know where to find more information. Another huge opportunity is something called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Um, that is a total of $27 billion that is intended to go to financial institutions or organizations that will help to finance green and clean energy development and investment in this country. Some people refer to it as a green bank or green banks. And there are some of those organizations around the country. Um, um, but this will um, jumpstart um, just light a flame under this kind of activity. So how do you finance solar roof panels in a poor neighborhood where most of the people don't own their own homes? How do you finance electric vehicle charging infrastructure in communities that do not have means? You have to have these kinds of organizations and this kind of help from government to help make that work. And this is really, really so exciting. And EPA is, going, is setting up and is going to be ad administering that. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of specific things related to the effort to, to, to open up these opportunities for communities all across the country that have traditionally not had the ability to access these resources. So we get that. And we're trying to um, help address that in a couple of ways. Um, the uh, infrastructure or the um, uh, Redu Inflation Reduction Act also provides a $3 billion grant, grant fund, $3 billion for environmental justice grants. This is on top of several other, for years EPA has had a small grants program in, in uh, our environmental justice office. Um, through um, other funds, we had, oh, $100 million in environmental justice grants. Now we have $3 billion. Um, and the president is absolutely determined that we're going to see faces at the table that we have not seen before. But how many of you have ever applied for a federal grant? I have two. It's hard, right? It's complicated. Um, it's intimidating. It's confusing. It often doesn't work. Um, the, we, we can't expect groups across the country to be able to be successful given that current system, especially on the kind of time frame that we're on. So we are going to be funding the establishment of um, what are called, um, let's see, I had it here, 
uh, Thriving Community Technical Assistance Centers. Um, I think that name was probably back calculated from the acronym Tic Tacs. Um, and we will have a number of those across the country who are going to be like storefront, ground floor organizations for community groups and other groups to come to for free help and advice on, on what kinds of resources are out there and how to access them. Um, we haven't had this before. Um, we've sort of relied on organizations to crop up um, uh, like the Environmental Resilience Institute and, and others, and it's not really their job. This will be the job of these entities, and hopefully they will be around for many years to come. We are also going to be funding pass-through grant makers so that um, community organizations and others won't have to be the ones to go through grants.gov. Somebody else will do that for them, and they will have a much simpler, more straightforward way um, to, to put their needs forward. So, um, so these are amazing opportunities, and there's much, much more. Um, and it's not just the EPA. It's the Department of Energy, the Department of Transportation, HUD, um, uh, all of these agencies that are working right now to make sure that these resources get used in the way that Congress and the President intended them to, um, and really bring across a, about the transformation, both in terms of addressing historical inequities and turning the tide on our action, both on climate change mitigation and adaptation. So lest you think that uh, we don't do regulations at EPA anymore, we do do regulations at EPA. Um, and uh, if you have me back another time, I can go into more detail. But I just want to assure you that we do have a very robust agenda of, of rulemaking going on, uh, much of which is in the climate space. Um, this includes motor vehicles, fossil fuel fired power plants, uh, the oil and gas industry, and methane um, uh, emissions, um, uh, as well as a host of um, uh, uh, well-established voluntary programs to help um, in areas like ports and, um, and rail yards and that, and that sort of thing. This is an incredible time. Um, and, uh, and on that work, too, um, we look to your support um, and engagement. Um, uh, usually when, when I would go and give talks at the end, people would say, well, what can I do? What can I do? Um, I, you may not ask that because you're already doing. You, you don't need me to tell you. Um, but I, I do want to emphasize um, that the partnership with organizations like this is absolutely critical. And you do a lot of our work for us when you already organize yourselves, which you have. So thank you. Bravo. So we need feedback from you. Um, we, need, we need the questions that um, where things aren't clear. Um, we need um, input on and comments on our rulemakings, including uh, information and data and analysis that comes from the research that is generated by people across the Midwest um, uh, who we rely on that kind of input to make sure that our rules are actually um, addressing the science um, and the policy in the way that they should. So um, please, please, um, keep on uh, doing what you're doing. One last note, which is um, for those of you that may be at the beginnings of your career um, or thinking about how it is you want to spend your precious work time, EPA and the federal government are hiring. Um, this is, I've never been able to say that before. I've had an entire career in the public sector, state and federal government. And I have never been able to say we are hiring. Um, uh, at EPA, our goal is to hire um, up to, to, to 2,000 people this year um, to do work on Inflation Reduction Act, Infrastructure Act, um, other um, obligations that we have um, uh, from Congress, and to replace the many EPA staff who are more than eligible for retirement. Um, we are a very gray agency. Um, and we do, not have, um, we do not have young people coming into the agency at the rate we need to in order to provide for that next generation of environmental and public health um, scientists and policy leaders and implementers in the country. So if you are in a um, position where you might be looking for um, a job, um, I, I would encourage you to look at EPA um, as somebody who has spent pretty much my entire career in the public sector. Um, you can make more money other places, I'm told. 
Um, uh, but um, it's hard to find a career that's as satisfying as working in the public interest, especially if you can work in your own home state, in your own community, helping your family and your neighbors um, to live a healthier, safer life. So with that, thank you, thank you so much for having me. Um, if there's still time for questions, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I wish you just a fabulous conference. And we'll look forward to connecting with many of you at, um, at, uh, at any time that you have a question. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. This was really wonderful tonight to have the impacts and the exacerbating circumstances around those so well laid out by Sylvia, and then to hear so much about the opportunities before us from Janet. So actually, Sylvia, if you'd like to um, join Janet up here, we've got time for a, a few questions. Um, and actually, I should introduce myself as well. I'm Heather Navarro, the director of the Midwest Climate Collaborative for all of you. Great, we do have a couple of roaming mics. Oh, no, no applause. No applause needed, but, um, but yes, thank you so much. Actually, let's have a round of applause for our speakers again. <laughs> so I'm going to, um, oh, I'm sorry, are you, are you two ready? I'm, um, I'm going to put one question out here that is a combination of questions on the app, and then we do have the mic, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll get that out to you. So one of the things that's... Um, come up from folks is just this sense of urgency. So it's wonderful that we have this great opportunity. It's wonderful that we have all of this knowledge and all of this data, but you know, are we doing enough fast enough? So what are the one or two things that you think need to happen to accelerate this action? Is, is it policy? Is it culture change? Is it research? And so, um, Sylvia, I'll, I'll go to you first with that. Oh, unless, unless you, you want to pass it to Jane. No, <laughs> you've, had, you've had a chance to, to rest your, your voice there a little bit. <laughs> Repeat the question. Sorry. Oh, I'm so I'm so sorry. So, given the sense of urgency, um, and we you know we have a lot of wonderful data, we have um, these wonderful funding opportunities, but still people are I think rightfully wondering you know is it enough? How do we really accelerate action? And especially you know given the challenges that you all have laid out too, uh, you know, and being here in the Midwest and those unique challenges, just what are you know one or two things that you think need to happen? Um, to accelerate that action, you know, is it is it education, policy, research? You know, where where would you direct us to to spend our our efforts? I'm going to mention um, Catherine Coleman Flowers from Lowndes. I think she is a she's a MacArthur Genius Grant. I think what she's doing, what Peggy Shepard is doing, is community education. So education is very pivotal. Individuals who are in these, in these spaces need to be aware of what's happening to them, and they need to be aware of the, the avenues in which to address these issues. So I would, I would put my vote in education. Um, I remember the, the research grant that I had with the NSF, and I had funding from the US Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, in the early 2000s to actually go out and to do community health education, environmental community health education. And when I went across the country and spoke to you know, thousands as part of that effort, there was, the rooms were always filled with tears. Everyone can't go to college and get an education in environmental studies. They're not going to study public health. But they always appreciate someone coming to them where they are and explaining the situation to them in a way that they can, they understand and can take action. Because even if it takes voting someone in who understands your issue to make policy changes, that is something. But they first have to have the education to know what to vote for. So education is in my vote. So I think I mean, we've been doing this for years and years and years, and um, it, it's never enough and it's never fast enough. We need to keep doing all that. I think these, these statutes that have provided this funding, there's been nothing like this in, in ever to, to really move things more quickly. So I, th and I'm 
you know, it's parochial because it's my job, right, to, to help do this. But, but we, we have to get these programs set up. You, you think about how long it takes government to do things, um, both because it's big and kind of lumbering, but also because we try to be transparent and inclusive. And if you really want to ask people for their input, you have to give them time to give it to you, and then you need to take time to pay attention to it. And before you know it, six months have gone by. Um, and then you need to put out a proposal, and then you need to put out a fine. You know, it's, these things all take a, a long time. Um, we, we, we have to set up these programs on a much faster um, time frame than that, but we also have to do them right, and we have to, um, we have to do them in a way that people are included. So, um, and, and I would agree that, that, you, that education goes along with that for sure. So one of the things we, when we talk about <clears throat> climate change and vector-borne diseases, and let's just go to like Lyme disease and, and, and ticks. So individuals who are just vacationing or just enjoying the outdoors, they need to have that understanding of what, how their geography is changing. I'm so grateful to have been one of the founding members of the Illinois EPA's Environmental Justice Commission under um, Governor Quinn. I was appointed to that, and prior to that, I was the Illinois EPA uh, elected chair of their Environmental Justice Advisory Group, and I had the opportunity to, to actually work with community groups. And they would come to our meetings, and they did not understand. They could not understand. When I did my MPH, uh, in environmental epidemiology, uh, we were looking at a community in West Chicago, Illinois, and they had increases in brain cancer clusters. These were just regular people, working class people who moved into an environment, moved into a geography, you know, trying to move up and out into this, to this western suburbs, and suddenly they were coming down with brain cancer, and they did not understand. They did not understand the relationship between thorium waste products. I mean, I'm, most people don't, right? But it's that basic education. And you know what? Up until, <laughs> probably up until now, how many individuals can go to school? I remember someone coming to us, a community group. It's like, how are we supposed to know this, Sylvia? No one's teaching us. Environmental, environmental education is not mandatory in K through 12, right? So where are they going to get it? How are they going to know that? So I have been, I started off as an environmental chemist. I became an environmental systems and control engineer. And I ended up working for NASA doing environmental impact on nuclear missions. I've been doing this for 40 years. And this has not changed. 40 years. 40 years. Education, right? You need to know the basics of math. We need to know the basics of the environment. When we say climate change, it shouldn't go over your head, right? Right? It shouldn't go over your head at 15 what climate change is. You should not be, <laughs> it's not an, uh, an optional fact, right? So train and educate our population very early so then they, they can be engaged. You vote at 18. If you voted 18, you should know about the climate and the environment before you turn 18. Great. That's what I would say. Thank you. I'd like to try and get in one more question for each of you. Um, so Janet, this one came in. What if a state does not have a green bank? Additionally, if the state has a green bank, how does it get distributed to localities? And I think this speaks to a bigger question that a lot of folks have. Um, and, and I know some of these grants get distributed differently. But if you're in a state, for example, that is not chomping at the bit to lead on climate, um, how can you make sure that that money is going to, to be available? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, it, this is a national program. Um, so it, it is not that we're collecting all the existing green banks and, and putting them in a room and, and giving them money to give out. Um, we're actually going to be putting out um, a, a request for proposals for organizations to come forward and say, here's who we are, here's what we do, um, and we would like to be one of your grantees. Um, so, and that'll, that'll all be happening um, over the course of this year. So there'll be opportunities for existing green banks, for existing, you know, there's all kinds of 
uh, words that describe these different sorts of financial institutions. Um, and it's not my field. So um, <laughs> we have, are getting experts at EPA to help us with this. So, um, so there will be opportunity out there. And I know that one of the, the, the key issues were, is going to be, um, uh, is there going to be national coverage um, under this program? Great, thank you. And I know we'll have more time this week to talk about uh, federal funding opportunities and who's out there to, to help you. Um, so this question um, for Sylvia, we, and this, I, I'm wondering if this came from one of our grant partners. We have a, an NSF Civic grant working on mitigating urban heat island effect through expanded tree canopy. So this question is, we know increasing tree canopy can help decrease UHI, urban heat island. However, newly planted trees require a lot of care, watering, pest management, that come at a cost for the residents in those neighborhoods. How can we reduce that burden on residents who don't have that time or money to spare? To plant trees. Well, and to maintain them. The long-term maintenance is often requires resources. So every community is different, right? So I mean, I mean I'll, I'll speak to the community that I live in, the, in the Midwest, <laughs> in Illinois. And, and so our community, little village of Winfield, a tree city, the village actually pays for trees to be planted mm -hmm. and will co-share. So I think this comes back to this environment. I'm going to use environmental literacy. And so in policy, so how do we engage? How do we get into conversation with our policymakers and the people that we elect uh, in, our, in our counties, in our villages, in our cities, and say, hey, we're paying taxes. We would like to have a certain amount of our money put in toward creating and maintaining green space. That's one way of approaching it. I was on the environmental commission for my village, so I remember these conversations with residents. Uh, you have forest preserves. You have counties. You have, so there's so many different bodies, governmental bodies, that can be tapped into and engaged with the community. We also have non-government agencies. We have Sierra Clubs. We have all, natural defense funds. You know what? Grants. Why can't they apply for grants to create that green space if they're committed? If we can have that conversation about trees and climate change and health, not, it's not just aesthetic. This is going to increase and improve the public health and population health by having trees. We can have the, and this is when you bring in your experts. So we could talk about reduction of asthma rates with increasing trees. Is human life worth the investment? Because I think for so long, environmentalists were demonized as being tree huggers and not connected to reality. What I like about my history, my trajectory, is that I was trained in, in, in epidemiology. I was trained in history and engineering. And so we need to have those cross conversations because the reality is it's an interdisciplinary problem. And it will take an interdisciplinary solution. Great. Well, thank you. That is all the time we have for questions. I know there are many more in the app, and if we can, um, you know, I think we can get a good conversation going in there. Thank you so much to both of you. And there is plenty of time um, this week in the workshops to talk more about the federal funding available, as well as Sylvia will be um, one of the panelists on a discussion tomorrow. And so I know we didn't get to get to all of your slides, but I am excited that um, hopefully we can hear more you know, tomorrow on, on these issues. So thank you everyone for coming. Please remember to sign up for your mobile workshop uh, before you leave tonight. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Breakfast starts at eight. And maybe if we all bring our umbrellas it won't rain tomorrow, right? That's how that's supposed to work. So thank you again. Thank you again to Janet and Sylvia and to all of you. Welcome, and we can't wait to see you tomorrow.